one of my favorite paintings is called The Free Blue Horses and nobody knows where it is. People think it's been stolen by Nazis and still don't know where it is. But yeah, that was very, um, a big shift for me in my artistic You were like, life. I'm gonna do like, shit like Damn. that. Yeah, because I'd never seen a blue horse before. I was just like, fuck. That's so, cool. Yeah. And you had a cubist one. style too? Yeah, or? very, very, very cubist. Um, very angular. Like you can see echoes of it in my work, especially. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, that really blew me away. How do you say his name again? Franz Mark. Franz Mark. I'll look it up. I'll look it up after the show. Yeah, I'll yeah, check it yeah. out. Yeah, his stuff's incredible. Really. Shit's about to go down. I'm feeling something in my spirit. Chops and Taps with Aaron Della Vidova. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Chats and Tats with me, your host, Aaron Della Vidova. Today, I have a man with me who I've just been a huge fan of his work. He's a tattoo artist, and I, I've been a huge fan of his work because of the fact that he's one of these guys, and I just respect this so much, and I wish I would have done more of this in my young career, who just decided to do what he wanted to do. Fuck it. I'm going to do art and tattoos the way I think are cool. And maybe some people will want to get those someday. Well, it turns out a lot of people do get those now. And he's wildly popular. His shit is dope as fuck. He's going to actually be tattooing me on the show today. So I'm extra honored for that. So, and he's a lot of other things. He's got a lot of opinions about culture and life and social media and uh, modern health. And so we're going to break it all down for you right now. But without further ado, please welcome my guest today, Mike Boyd. Thank you very much, man. You're welcome. Thank dude. you, man. I'm going to cut in right now. You yeah. blew a little bit my mind because yes. when you came out and did your guest spot with us, you said today it was three years ago, right? Yeah. Here at Guru. Yeah. I wasn't familiar with your work before you came out. And when you, you know, of course they tell me this guy's coming to do a guest spot. I get on your Instagram and right away I'm like, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so rare to see a person who's doing something, literally no one does anything even close to like it. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I don't know the ones that are copying you by now. And I'm sure by now there are a few. There are a few, yes. I, I knew that was you were gonna say that. But I mean, when you cranked into this style, I mean, I don't have words for it. You use the word, word a wild color, um, graphic in nature. Mm -hmm. I kind of use the word avant-garde, uh, oh, meaning, cool. I, I don't want to use abstract art, I use Picasso. Like the, you're using like shapes and in, in angles to create the images, mm -hmm. very graphic in nature, graffiti-esque. Yeah. And then of course your color schemes aren't your traditional black, red, blue. It's it's like pink and aquas and you know, so there's that in there too. But it's, and you know, you guys, we'll, we'll have some of his stuff kind of flashing through the screen for you guys to check out. And of course we'll leave you with his uh, Instagram and all that for you to check out. But your stuff is different, dude. And yeah, it's cool. Thank you. And I'm, I'm stoked, I'm stoked you do it and I'm stoked it's caught on. I mean, you 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 do. That's all you do. You yeah, know? it's not like you're yeah. doing walk-ins or black and gray work, right? Yeah, yeah. Thank God. Yeah, I've done my time with that. Um, I think it's uh, important as a tattooer to kind of cut your teeth on walk-ins and you know a broad spectrum of stuff to begin with, and then you can kind of f find your groove and what that's, that's really true. excites you. It's true. You gotta doing black and gray, doing a walk-in lettering, doing all these little things that are big things sometimes that we do when we're not uh, prolific and booked, teaches you all these different levels yeah. of technique. Yes, you learn how definitely. the needles work. You learn how to get a thin line, not yep. just always a thick line. And and then from there you branch into your whatever yeah, it is. Whatever you're yeah. excited about. Yeah, I mean, I had a lot of, lot of influences growing up. Um, I was really obsessed with like the cubist movement in the early cubist, 20th century. Right, yeah, right. I loved all of that. Like that stuff blew me away. Like my favorite artist is Franz Mark. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. I don't think I have. He only painted for like two or three years and then ended up being called up for the First World War and died, unfortunately. Oh. Yeah, but he, there's one of his, one of my favorite paintings is called The Free Blue Horses and nobody knows where it is. People think it's been stolen by Nazis and still don't know where it is. But yeah, that was very, um, a big shift for me in my artistic You were like, life. I'm gonna do like, shit like Damn. that. Yeah, because I'd never seen a blue horse before. I was just like, fuck. That's so, cool. Yeah. And really he had a cubist away. style too? Yeah, very, very, very cubist. Um, very angular, like you can see echoes of it in my work, especially. Um, but yeah, that really blew me away. How do you say his name again? Franz Mark. Franz Mark. I'll look it up. I'll look it up after the show. Yeah, I'll check yeah, it yeah. out. Yeah, his stuff's incredible. Really.
Well, on that on that note of of we kind of brushed on like you get into tattooing, you got to do whatever in the beginning. I like I mean, how did you break into tattooing? I think you had told me you were in you, you as you guys call it in the UK, uni. <laughs> uni, yeah, you not were in college. Uni. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, everybody, Mike's from the UK. Yes, yeah, so just I, uh, moved to New York City. Flew out a week ago. Yeah, a week flew ago. out here to San Diego to be on my show. The man. man right there. I can't believe you made it. Man, thank you. But you, you're you from the UK and that's where you broke. You were in university. You were, um, and you, tell me how that, how'd you become a tattoo artist? How'd that unfold? Um, so I always had a very artistic mindset, was always drawing. My mum is very creative and it's definitely where I get a lot of my color ideas from. And she was very, um, you know, you always look up to your mum and like, I was just like, wow, she's making amazing stuff she's more into textiles and quilting and stuff like that but i was always drawing as a kid and i always i did art up to a level which is i don't know what the equivalent of that is here but before uni or college yeah mm. um so i wanted to do art um but my parents my dad was just like no why don't you kind of do something academic and then you can always do art in your spare time mm. and i was just like okay so Sacked off the art idea, ended up going through clearing, which is kind of like if you don't necessarily have the grades, you can do a foundation year. And so I ended up doing biological sciences, uh, two hours north of London in a small city called Norwich, and was just there and was drawing a lot. And I was always, always obsessed with tattoos. I remember seeing my first tattoos from a young age and being like, cool, mm. this is sick. Like, look at that. Like the idea of just having like, you know, I consider the skin blank and then you can put shit on it and it looks better. And I was just like, that's so cool. But I remember like my parents being like, no, don't, don't you dare. So as soon as I got my first like student loan in, I got towed and I was just like, this is sick. And then, um, yeah, while I was at uni and I was just studying and partying and um, I met these guys who, a piercer who was actually worked in the shop that I got my first tattoo from and I and we started a band together kind of just didn't really happen but I, I introduced me to the rest of the guys in the shop mm -hmm. and I was just like this is cool mm -hmm. started hanging out in the shop and I was like oh this is fucking sick like this is better <laughs> than doing biology you know I was just like this is dope and then uh the boss of the shop rang me up and was just like I need someone to cover front of house because my front of house is ill and I was just like fuck it I'll do it mm -hmm. so at the time I was working in a nightclub I was doing uni and then I started getting a Saturday job just front of house in this tattoo shop and then that was it. The doors opened and I was just like, this is sick. And then I moved into uh, a flat or well, a house with the piercer and one of the towers. And then I was like, I could fucking do this. And they gave you your apprenticeship. Yeah. So that was 2009. I started my apprenticeship and it was an apprenticeship baptism of fire. You know, it wasn't, I got taught how to set up and but I mean, no, I was, I was made so many fucking mistakes. They didn't really teach you much. No, nah, it was just very, you know, I think that kind of, that helped in a degree to kind of my attitude to tattooing of just like, fuck it, do it. You know, if you, if you can, if right. you can do a solid line, if you can do solid color, solid shading, do whatever fucking subject matter you want. Like, you know, it wasn't, it felt it very, very freeing in, in a aspect, but yeah, I mean, I fucked shit up for, too long, like lining with a shader and, you know, schoolboy <laughs> errors like that. Like, so nowadays, these guys weren't like, um, you know, they weren't really teaching you tr real solid, traditional technical not application. No, nah, not like what you were just left on your own to figure it out. Probably with the other guys you worked with, like, yeah. hey, man, what are you, how are you doing that? Like, yeah. Show me that. Yeah, I was even like in my own room. Like I was even isolated from the rest of the shop because it was like kind of like, I don't want to say like uh, like small individual booths, but there was like, there was one room where it had space for two stations and there was a single room that I was in. So I was just left there and now I was just doing walk-ins. I was just doing- Just figuring it out all yeah, by yourself. Just, yeah, yeah, just fuck it, let's <laughs> find so out, you know? That's uh, a little bit like mine too. I eventually found a, a teacher that knew how to tattoo. I mean, he had a heroin addiction and, and a problem with guns and knives, but he knew how to tattoo. <laughs> so there was, that was the trade off. <laughs> Um, well, that's cool. So, but yeah, that probably took you a couple of years before you could. Fuck yeah, dude. Two, at least two years before I was, you know, pulling a good line. And, you know, you know, those, those times when you like something goes wrong with your machine and you have that hot flush of less like, what, am I gonna do? what do I do? <laughs> you know, so I just start from like 
the power supply, then the clip cord, then the machine, and then the needle, and then like, I'd always have that protocol of just seeing what was wrong. But yeah, like that was in in Norwich, and like every now every now and then I go up there and see my old friends from there, and every now and then I see the old tattoos, and I'm like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was a, a baptism of fire, and um, you know. Got thrown and in you eventually the get the hang of it. And I think you had mentioned you you sort of fell into black and gray realism. Yeah, that was That's like, so funny too, because it's so black, far from what yeah, I do it's now. It's the polar opposite of what yeah, you do. Yeah, yeah. It was um, you know, when I was younger, like I was I was drawing like my hands a lot and I was kind of doing kind of like um I was always a big fan of like MC Escher and like that kind of I was like I really enjoyed surrealism and I really liked the kind of how precise that was mm. like i've got i've definitely got ocd that hasn't been diagnosed but how my brain works i love that mathematical I think side all of, of things artists have a little bit <laughs> yeah of that. there's there's something going on yeah, yeah. so i re i was really drawn to his stuff uh just because i loved how precise it was and especially when he did those those like long like morphs when it'd be like mm. a chessboard and it'd go into birds and yeah, I, I really really loved that and so I was always in, impressed with that kind of etching and getting those gradients, getting the values in the right place. So I would say that it, when I started tattooing, there was very much, it was the era of what I would call the David Beckham sleeve. So a lot oh, of the mashed right. potato clouds, the right. clapping hands people yeah. would say and all of like He the, started that wildfire. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it, like I was a bit after the kind of the, the late nineties tribal where from what I what I think about it now in retrospect is that it's what people get when they want quick coverage. Right. So, right. you know, solid black, spiky tribal was massive in the UK for years. Well, and no, Tommy Lee started that. Exactly. Yeah. Back, Rory Keating, shout out to Rory Keating. He, <laughs> did he, he do? He worked, yeah, Rory did. Uh, Sick. Hit, yeah, Tommy's back. And that was, I think, uh, you know, tribal was there that before was that. But banned, after that, it? I mean, it like, blew up. Yeah. yeah. Um, and what's that film with George Clooney when he's got the tribal on his neck uh, from Dust Till Dawn? Oh, right. So that when he had it poking yeah. out the top, they, they would always Dude, come in. Dude, I remember after that, that. that movie came out, we had at least two guys a week come in and want that identical that? Yeah. piece yeah. done. Had to come up on the yeah, neck. Yeah, and a bit uh, down onto the hand. hand. Yeah, man. That was, it's um, funny how uh, certain cultural figures will get a certain tattoo. And it it sets us off on like 10-year tangents. In the yeah, tattoo yeah. Industry. I mean, it taught me <laughs> what I do now, you know. It's, it's really incredible. So where I was working in Norwich, like there's um, a lot of offshore rigging. So there's a lot of like um, people would get helicopters out into like the North Sea and do a lot of shit out there. So they would make a lot of money, come back, and they'd be like, right, I want to sleep in five days. And they would just be, I was like, all right. Right. And they'd reference David Beckham, anything like that. So, that, yeah, a lot of drawing on those mashed potato clouds, I call them. So just like that, <laughs> put a silhouette of a star on it. Gosh, you've got to sleep. Do some rays of light coming out of it. Ooh, yeah. you added the rays of yeah, light. Yeah, all that shit, man. So <laughs> I remember getting a Tim Hendrix machine, and that was like, I was, I was able to get like my black and gray a lot smoother. And yeah, yeah so that was... So you're, so you're chugging along doing this. I get it. I mean, yeah. the, these are your, basically, these are the people with the money. These are the, this is what they want. Yeah, paying my rent. It's like when I got into it, like, you know, you didn't have a choice. You had to pay your rent, right? Yeah. When does this happen? Your work you do now, is there a, a distinctive moment? Yes. Yes, there is. I want to hear about is. that moment. How, uh, how a guy goes from mashed potato clouds <laughs> to, to what it is you do now, that's, I want to hear. So I- um, It must have invo involved uh, hallucinogenic. Yeah, funny you should say that. Oh, it, it did? It did, It yeah. looks like a hallucinogenic break. Through yes, to me. it did. So I was um, <laughs> I was dabbling with psychedelics, and I had took some acid with um, a couple of friends of mine. Had this fucking wild time, and then um, I just started doing this kind of like I guess what you would call now that kind of like watercolor effect, that splash effect. So mm. I started like I had. I remember the first thing I ever did in the style of it. It was a painting of a robin. Um, it was just perched on a um, a little like uh, like log, I guess, and he was there, and he had his red breast out, and he had his head tilted, and I remember like doing the lines, and I was just like, oh, you know, you could really change this up. So I started like painting it and like kind of like whipping it out more, and I was just like, huh. And then I started to just kind of like you just how I do stuff now is I look at like the fundamental shapes of what makes up whatever I'm doing, mm -hmm. and then I kind of that enables me to get the shapes and the sympathetic angles and stuff. So I started to, that was like the real 
uh, the beginnings of it. And then I started just like fucking, I was a big fan of like Ralph Steadman's work mm -hmm. and like how he does his splashes and mm -hmm. stuff. So I did that and then I posted it on, this was like the very beginnings of Instagram in like 2012, 2013. And then a friend of mine wanted it. And then I was just like, fuck it, let's do it. And then I started doing similar stuff on friends that was kind of very, um, rudimental when I was just very trying it out, see how it would heal and doing it for free after hours on Friends. But unfortunately I was so, so typecasted with doing the black and gray because a lot of these offshore guys they all work together so they're all like oh yeah go see so you were inundated with them all the time yeah and you know i had i was booked up for like six months and i was just doing this stuff but you know i'd try and shift this color stuff but they don't they don't want to see that they're just like Man. i could just see an oil rig no offense to your work but i don't see an oil rig worker wanting what you do now no not at all <laughs> it's, <laughs> not what, at it's all. way more just kind of artsy yeah for lack of a better word yeah it really is now I wasn't doing enough of what I wanted to do. And that started to get me pissed off with doing the black and gray. And I started to, you know, the fun of actually like the novelty of being able to tattoo and considering myself a professional tattoo, I was just like, fucking yeah, that, that buzz had gone and it started to wane and I started to get annoyed. And I was just like, oh, I don't want to be doing this because uh, that then affects the end result. So I yeah, when you start showing up at work, in, at your dream job and you're annoyed to be there you're annoyed with the work you have to do that's a sign to, to change something yeah. Yeah. so it wasn't happening i wasn't doing what i was really interested in so me and a buddy of mine we came down to london to go see a roy lichtenstein at the tate modern um exhibition and then it just i was we said to each other under the waterloo bridge actually he was just like do you want to move to london and i remember being like fuck yeah Let's do it. And then January 2014, I moved to London, um, had a dabble in a small shop that wasn't quite up and running and wasn't quite what it promised it to be. And then I ended up getting a job at The Circle, which, you know, shout out to Ash for giving me a chance on a guy who was just like, who, who had a good black and gray clientele, but it was just like, said to him, I don't want to do this. I want to do the color. And he was just like, all right, dude. Mm. And he enabled me to flourish and, that first year in London was rough because like my rent had tripled. I'd given up on the black and gray, you know, and I didn't have any work. And I was just painting and I was doing a lot of stuff with Copic markers or Copic markers. And I just said to myself, I was just like, just put out a design every night. Just mm. just do a design when you get in. Just just put it out. Just keep doing that and you'll get it. And then, yeah, there was this real crunch time. Where I was just like, I was doing the, the maths on my account like numbers and stuff and I was just like this isn't financially viable anymore and then two weeks later I got an interview in one of the biggest magazines in the UK for tattooing and then that was it it all changed I love it stop right there because I swear to god that moment happens to so many artists and I don't know I, I call it the universal firewall but I, I feel like for artists to break through to their true selves whether it be a musician or a sculptor or a tattooer it always pushes you into a corner where you think it's all Fucked. Fuck. <laughs> yeah. I'm fucked. Yeah, I'm for dude. sure fucked. And it's usually at that moment, it's it's all I feel like it's saying, what are you gonna do now? You're fucked. Are yeah. you gonna bail? Yeah. You're yeah. gonna go back to the black and gray. You're gonna go move back home. And yeah. then when you don't, literally, sometimes within days, it hands you the breakthrough. Yeah. And that you just said it. It you're like, I'm fucked. This isn't financially viable. Three weeks later, you get in this big magazine and boom. Yeah, all change. All change. That's I remember so cool. We had my um, girlfriend at the time. We even had the uh, like the sign that the kind of like the break lease on the contract signed by both of us, and we were going to give it to the landlady like this week. And then I said to my girlfriend at the time, I was just like, "Let's hold fire. Like I've got this interview coming up. Let's just see how that does. Like I've got like two months rent left that I." could we can scrape on let's just see um yeah and here and we are it, and then it, yeah, and yeah, that's yeah. when it really started going yeah, that, everything escalated from that that's uh, um i started like doing more com i did like the kind of convention circuit around the uk and i started just pushing just i had just had color flash that i just set out on my booth and i'd, like, I'd go there with no bookings just sit and wait and hope Right. And, and just and be busy. Probably. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, and like just kind of like just hustling, you know. What I really like about the US is that you, if you want to I'm just going to ask you the difference, and maybe you're going there already, but I want to know the difference between the UK, tattoo-wise, and US in your opinion. I mean, the UK and a lot of Europe 
is, is, is changing now, but it's very black heavy. And a lot of this, what I call glorified line work, like, mm. you know, there's a lot of like- And it's very photo real, that photo realism. Photo realism, all of that stuff like coming out of the Eastern Bloc of right, like right, Europe. Like, right. I mean, I used to be obsessed with realism. It was when I started like messing around with color tattooing, that was kind of the people who I really looked up to were realism artists. And I got some realism tattoos and I started messing around with it. And But for me, it was too, laborious and two it, it didn't feel enjoyable you know you mm. had to always watch the stencil you had to be it took fucking forever you know you're yeah. there with tiny needles you've got like a plethora of colors in front of you and you're like oh free rinse cups you try, oh yeah it just really got on my tits so i just fucked it off yeah and started doing the stuff that was like powerful and uh, striking yeah. yeah you know but then, of course, that comes with a whole new thing of learning how to pack color properly and how mm. to do smooth gradients. And so, back to the difference, though, oh, from, yes. from Europe to the to, to American tattoo. Yes. Yeah, so the difference is, I would say here you here I, I find it's a lot more. You've got like the kind of the real history, and there's a lot more of the Americana mm. and the kind of that kind of American Japanese is obviously massive here. You've kind of got that neo trad vibe as well. Um, for me, I love it over here because there's a lot more color, a mm. lot more color. Whereas I find in Europe, there's a lot of black work and uh, it just bores me, to be honest. Like, yeah. um, so I, I'm lucky that I managed to like find my niche over in the UK of like what I do and create my own kind of thing. Um, so. But there just wasn't enough of the work that I really liked and people who I could talk to and discuss like yeah. what I liked doing, you know? So basically you're, you just, the, the US market is, is a, there's a lot more people who want what you do here. Yeah, They're and it's a lot more professional here as well. Like I really like admire like how you run Guru. It's done properly. It's done like a business. Thank and, you. You know, it's like you've had it for what? 13 20 years, years is this it year. damn yeah. dude congratulations thank man. you congratulations thank you. you know i really like the hustle of the us i really really it's you know if you want it you can get it mm. whereas i find in the uk there's a lot of red tape there's a lot of like stuff that gets in the way of you making a successful business like we have business rates in the uk we have council taxes and stuff like that mm. whereas you do I, I, maybe now we're getting a little closer to another thing i wanted to talk about because you just you did just move from the uk to new york city yeah um, last week like you live there now yeah um and what you know tell me i mean obviously we, i've already heard like the market is you feel stronger and the people here are more into what you do and you're going to mm -hmm. be able to expand your career more vastly here in the U.S. But what are the other reasons? I mean, I know you had mentioned like, I don't know, what's going on over there that sucks, that drove you out? The Brexit thing really fucked everything up. Like we had a like the referendum in 2016, which I fully couldn't fathom. Like, uh, you know, I, I lived in London and it's such a cosmopolitan multicultural city. Mm. So many influences, which as far as I'm concerned, makes it better. But apparently people outside of London thought very differently. And, you know, I really think that they got fed lies by the press and the government had an ulterior motive. I think a lot of, well, I think a small amount of people got very rich from it. Um, so I started setting up like my merch and my paintings and stuff. I sold to Europe like willy nilly and we were all on and I could travel around Europe like no visas, nothing like that. I had like a nice convention circuit that I did and I'd go guest spot all around Europe. It was great, you know, see different cultures, all the food. It was great. And then in 2016, there was this referendum on shall we leave Europe? And I think it was 51% yes, 49% no. Mm. And then, you know, democracy being what it is, that was it, we left. And then that all came into effect in 2020, literally the same time as the pandemic. And then I saw today the Financial Times posted that the UK went from being one of G7's most robust economies to now one of the weakest, you know. And I just, uh, you know, there was, they had to ration tomatoes in the supermarkets. Wow. Like, yeah, it's like there's backlogs at the, there's supply chain issues. Um, all small biz, like so many small businesses within London are closed. There's a lot of empty shops like on Oxford Street, which is like, you know, mm. like a main fucking strip, you know, and it's like, it's crazy. And like there's a, a big like shopping um, clothing company called Topshop that went bust last year. And it's bad, you know, and it's, mm. it really... 
made me, it really was a nail in the coffin of just like, right. fuck this. I and your ability to travel is totally different now. Yeah, too. and like I wasn't able to, people stopped buying from Europe completely when I was looking at my um, analytics on Big Cartel and like I hadn't had an order into Europe since the beginning of 2020, like the first lockdown. So your export business is just dead. fell off. And I was your just Your ability like, to travel is now limited with red tape. Yeah. Your economy in your city is in the shit. Yeah. No one wants to buy anything because they're scared, you know? And wow. Yeah, it's, it's not looking good. And now we've got all problems with strikes because the government aren't pay, paying people. And now we've got the energy crisis. So our energy is like, if you want to get like gas and electric, some places it's gone up like, I think, I, I don't quote me on this, but like 60% in some areas. Wow. And then because of how many people were claiming insurance on small businesses during COVID, some people's insurances have gone up 50%. Oof. Yeah, you know. I mean, I, um, I, I love getting my news like this from the source like you lived there <laughs> yeah you know, nowadays than, especially i mean i just I'm i don't so, trust anything <laughs> I, yeah, I'm very, I listen to, i listen to a lot of stuff but I, and i don't say it isn't true i just keep it kind of like well maybe i don't know yeah. it's really nice to talk to somebody who who lived there who mm. left and you're telling me hey i was there this is what i saw happening yeah. on the ground yeah it's bleak you know and like uh the like i, I know a lot of tattooers who are struggling you know, and like we have mm. nurses who like, you know, look after like with our NHS, it's like falling through the floor and like NHS workers now have to go to food banks because they can't afford to buy food. And you're like, these are the people that are delivering our babies, helping your mom. You That's know? scary, dude, to, yeah. to think that those people. Yeah. And teachers as well. You know, it's, it's really worrying. It's scary. Wow, I wonder. um you know, I always feel like there's a, a certain level of propaganda and cover up happening in our major news networks because I just don't feel like that message is reaching us. I'm sure it is because the head of the BBC is like in the pocket of the Tories who uh, like conservatives who are in charge. Right. So they don't want to really let it out. They don't shitty let that things shit are. Out. Yeah. yeah. And then we had all the stuff during like uh, Partygate, which was our ex-Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who was just getting, having parties in number 10 Downing Street while we were all locked down. And you can see your relatives while they were getting fucked up. And you're just like, what? Yeah, yeah. yeah really bad. That's fucking nuts, dude. Well, yeah. there you have it. He just got here a week ago. That's what <laughs> yeah. he saw. That's what his eyes saw. You went there, man. I mean, <laughs> this might be the best news source out right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm biased. Well, that's, I mean, I mean, that sucks. That's horrible. And I feel for the people that are there, I'm happy for you. I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. happy that you're in New York, New York now and yeah, you've got this new... You. New place where, you know, I mean, we, we, we suffered uh, economically. We were shut down. Um, you know, and I, again, I don't want to speak for the United States of America. I, I really only can speak to the part of the country I live in. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm here in Southern California. Things seem pretty okay. I mean, nice. there's some little hiccups and bubbles where you hear people that really got screwed over the COVID times and they did go out of business. But mm -hmm. generally speaking, we don't see it that like that at all. People seem to be doing good. Okay, nice. That's good. That's good. Yeah. One thing I did notice, there seems to be more homeless people. Here in San Diego? Yeah. Or in, oh, oh, okay. I think just generally in oh, there the is. US. Because I like last year I went up to Portland to see my friends up there. Portland that out, of, there. out of control. Yeah, that really blew my mind. Because I was there pre-pandemic and then seeing it in July last year, I was just like, whoa. And the I don't want to get too, I, I, I'll say this gingerly. What I, I have friends in Portland. Mm -hmm. I asked them about that and it is out of control. Yeah. Um, Portland's a very um, left leaning city and um, San Francisco, very left leaning city. San Francisco is another, another one. I have friends that tattoo up there and they're like, what the, yeah, it yeah, like, yeah, yeah. they can't, you know, streets where you could just walk around and go to dinner. They're just littered with tent cities now. And so, wow. and, she, and they, and what they've told me, cause I, I asked, I was like, why? You know, I know COVID had, well, he said, well, COVID's part of it. A lot of people got lost their jobs and stuff. Yeah. So you just have more people who became homeless. But then I guess they they were telling me it's just these left leaning cities are just became a, maybe a little too tolerant of it. And they're just like, let them be, let them be. And your more conservative cities are, I don't know what they do. I mean, here in San Diego, it's funny to me that in San Diego is definitely, I think, considered one of the more conservative cities in California. Yeah, Nothing right. like San Francisco. But you, and I'm not saying we don't have homeless, but you just, I didn't see increases at all okay. in, in the areas okay. that I, you know, Pacific Beach where one of my shops is, mm -hmm. it seems the same. Right here, um, we're in downtown San Diego, right near the airport. 
I don't know, maybe there's a couple more, you know, but nothing like you're hearing out of, of, the, of those places. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I really don't have the answer to that. I'm just kind of yeah. saying what it's, I see. You know? It seems, I don't know where you begin or what you have to deal with, what, where you begin to like tackle that problem. Um, it, it seems like it's a mental health crisis as yeah. well. And yeah. I think what is, what a big difference between here in the UK is like, we have like a benefit system. So say, uh, you know, if, everything goes to shit and you lose your house at least in the uk you can get housing and you can get a benefit where you're on kind of like job seekers allowance is what it's mm -hmm. called is where you get a set amount each week and you have to go to the job office and you have to be actively looking for work to get the benefit we have that oh do you it's okay, called cool. unemployment oh okay so yeah if you get laid know. off you if way i understand it same thing if you if you can prove you're out hunting for a job you keep getting your unemployment oh i didn't realize yeah. i thought you just but i don't know if it goes on forever i don't know right. there, i'm sure there's like i don't know maybe it's a year or six months and at some point right you don't land off. that job it stops right okay but yeah that that yeah i think we're getting into way over our head i don't oh, know yeah, i mean it's not my pay grade you know? no even i need <laughs> but, house. <laughs> and i i want to say simple things like to me i feel like it's like more money put into those areas, to, you know, to help these people. And then you'll have people say, you could dump a trillion dollars and they ain't going away. It just, it, that money can't fix it. So I, I don't know where I stand on that, but it is, it is sad to me um, to see people who I, I agree, it seems like a mental health crisis, most mm -hmm. of it. I've, I've talked to enough homeless people and I can, don't yeah. need to be a psychologist when I talk to them to realize, okay, this guy just needs medicine and therapy. Yeah. He's obviously yeah, yeah. He's massively things aren't connecting correctly. Yeah. It's not just, oh, he's an alcoholic who doesn't want to go to work. Yeah. And I think, you know, if you if you have some sort of mental health issue anyway, and then say if you, you know, you, you become addicted to heroin and stuff like that, it's, it's going to exacerbate it. Yeah, it's it's just going to snowball. Yeah. Keep going. Um, well, on the on that note, maybe we'll kind of segue a little. You had mentioned the use of hallucinogenics in therapy. Thera we're kind of talking about therapeutic yeah. usages. Yeah, uh, I didn't know much about you. Just brushed over it. Tell me about that. Like, what has been your experience with hallucinogenics? Um, so, I, I would say in my younger years, it was is a lot more of a party kind of like, oh, see some colorful yeah. shit, have a great time, you know. Um, me too. But then, as I got older, I kind of left the party scene. And British culture is is like they enjoy alcohol. Mm -hmm. Like there's a very there's the pub culture. You know, you can drink on the street. So mm -hmm. like in London, you can like especially on Friday afternoon, you'll just see like people sprawling on the street and just getting fucked up. Right. And you know, I've I've had my time of being fucked up and stuff. But you know, it was it was the anxiety that came from alcohol two three days later that I it was affecting my work and like when stuff affects my work that's when I really like oh, I need to reevaluate this so now I drink less and but there was definitely struggled with empathy in my life before I kind mm. of I can see stuff very black and white um I can just be like well just do that rather than seeing the human side of it mm. so I did a guest spot out in Denver uh, in 2019 um, and met up with do you know destroy troy sounds makes the so, machines sounds so familiar um, big psychedelic advocate and stuff and we'd we'd been online chatting and friends and then i was i was out there and i slid into his dms and i was like dude it'd be nice to hang out yeah you know you've been talking and stuff and so we climbed a mountain and he was just like do you want to take some mushrooms and i was just like oh it's been a while you know i don't want to be tripping balls i've just met you like this i don't want to wig out halfway up a mountain um but you know it's just like yeah it's just a microdose so we we were just chatting a lot about you know the benefits that he's personally had with it and i was just like okay so i came back to the uk from the guest spot and i started looking into it and then um uh, I'm like a avid boulderer and I found just randomly this girl who I climbed with uh, at the gym and she was just like, oh, I grow mushrooms. And I was just like, oh, sick. So we started talking about like what she recommended doing and stuff. And I was just like, okay. So made an order, got it. Um, and then, yeah, just the, there was this side of me that completely opened up. It felt like I was put in like this accountability mirror of myself, mm -hmm. of just being like, these are your shortcomings. These are things you mm -hmm. need to work on where 
where personally I think alcohol numbs that and it kind of gets rid of your inhibitions. So you're kind of way more, you know, you're way more chatty and you just don't care as much until you get the anxieties the next day and, you know, you're feeling like horrible. And is this, it, no, no, this so. experience you're having, this inner reflection of your own, what things you need to work on, is this from microdosing or from? Yeah, from microdosing. So I, I had a routine of I would take it, I, I did four days in a row. Uh, so I would have between 0.2 and 0.3 uh, I'd have that every morning with a shot of coffee on an empty stomach. I've always had a high tolerance to substances, so I, 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 there was no visuals, nothing like that. So I was, you know, I know people take a lot less than that for a microdose, but what I do is I do that for eight weeks and then I'll have four to six weeks off to kind of flush and then I'll do it again. So um, wait, four days on? Three days off. Four, three, four, three yeah. for eight weeks. And then you'll take six weeks completely off. Yeah, completely off. Won't touch anything. I'm always interested in people's patterns because this is a big debate right now. And I've heard different. Yeah, I've done different ones. I've done, I've tried the the Stamets, is it Stamets stack where you have mushrooms, lion's mane, and then there's another drug that can, apparently cancels the hallucinogenic properties. Mm. So people who are worried about microdosing and thinking that they're going to trip. So they can cut, you have this to cancel. So I tried that and that was okay. And then I tried to do, I can't remember what the other type is called, where you do a day on, a day off, a day on, a day off. But I had much better results for the four days in a row because mm. it felt like on day three, day four, it felt like this kind of like, you know, compounding effect of like, it felt there was more in my system and the benefits were more, mm -hmm. more like mm -hmm. tenfold. When I tell people about it, I say like the first week to two weeks, I just feel incredible. Mm. anxieties fall off i feel like a creative genius everything's free flowing i feel like mm. um uh, say like you your creative process is getting from a to b and for me without mushrooms i find that that goes like this you know and then you get to be up and down and up yeah and down. you know whereas i find when i'm microdosing it's just like bing straight line. straight there mm. like the end goal is there before my hand can catch up Wow. Which is like, and it's, cool. it's eerie because you're just like, oh yeah, that makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. And so much, like I, I'm an avid like weed smoker as well. And for me, what I like about marijuana is that I have a lot of brain chatter, mm -hmm. a lot of just noise in my head that, can, that, that I know gets in the way of me. I, I procrastinate with it. I'll just sit there and like, I'll just be like. Wah, 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 wah. Talking to yourself. Just, bullshit in my I head. I think everybody does. Yeah. Whereas when I smoke, that cuts that out. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it really helps me focus. Do you have an on and off with marijuana? Um I I've been smoking every day for like fifteen years. Yeah, I I, I, love I, it. I used to be like that. And but I, I try a break. Yeah. I, I've done like sabbaticals where I'll take time off. You do. Okay. And what was really, really strange. And that's not me against marijuana. I think it's great. But when I take my breaks and come is back it, to it, it, it's better? like, oh my God, it's, it's almost like the mushrooms. I think you just got to do the, you got to be the, the, the on and off. Yeah. It yeah. seems to work better okay. for me. What was really strange was last week, like, you know, like moving to New York, moving to a new country and setting up a new home is obviously stressful. Right. Um, and I didn't want to ship anything over to New York. So I got rid of a vast amount of pretty much everything that I own. I put, I took five boxes, like that sort of size to my parents to put in their loft and that's it. Turned oh. up with three suitcases, very cathartic experience, very very nice to realize that how right. much you don't need you know all right all right that sounds cool um so you know i got to new york and then i had to get the bank account phone number and apartment and i was going at it like i saw like maybe like 12 13 apartments luckily i got it and like i was speaking to you earlier about right. you know i was i was pretty strung out and i always have weed as like my go-to of just like you know zen out mm -hmm. but i had my first like prang out on it Mm. Um, like, and I was like, I just paid like a massive lump sum to the real realtor. And I was just like, fuck, like, what if I've just been fleeced? Like, what? <laughs> I was just like, shit, I don't know this guy. And I, I just really wigged myself out. I mean, I was just in Brooklyn and I was like messaging my mate being like, fuck, like I was fine combing the contract. And I was just like, fuck. Mm. And like, that has never, ever, ever happened to me. And I was just like, whoa. So... Because I, I, I took five days off when I landed in New York from smoking because I was like, I need to get on this. I need to bang this shit out. Mm. So 
I think I just smoked a blunt and like what I would normally do. And I think I just slapped myself too hard and I just peeked out, man. I was just like, whoa. So that was a real like, bam. Um, but also as well, the weed here is fucking crazy strong, you know? Like <laughs> I'm smoking something that's like 35% THC and I'm like, shit, like, you know, so... Yeah, I've been. So you're saying you 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 after you smoked that blunt, you got hit with this crazy paranoia. Yeah, that normal people have, you know, <laughs> right. when they say. Well, you're oh, also know. in an acute moment where you had a lot of anxiety. Anyway. Yeah, exactly. It just amplified. It, it did. It really marijuana will amplify a good yeah. mood. Yeah, yeah, it'll bang. amplify yeah, anxiety. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's totally. an amplifier. Yeah, it really um, a whole new respect for it. A whole new um, like damn. So yeah, I've I've definitely since that I've cut back. Um, and then flying out here, obviously, I had to come out here and then I've had a lot of work on here and I was just like, you don't need to be dealing with that. Mm. So, yeah, I've taken a bit of time off from that. Um, well, you also mentioned before you flew out here, you had a going away moment with, with yes, Dimeth with some good, some good friends. Yeah, a good send off with my, my friends. I wanted to Hash hear about that. I love hearing about people's experiences with DMT. Yeah, so it's... It's super hard to get hold of trips in the UK generally. Okay. And I tried salvia when I was really young because that used to be legal in the UK. You it was could legal get like, here for a while too. Yeah, you could get times 40 extract just in a head shop. And I remember they trying it. Yeah. And my mate was just like, hit this, hold it in for 10 seconds, then exhale. And it was my first outer body experience. And I was just like, this is legal? I like, fuck. <laughs> Blew my mind, man. And then like I, that, that kind of like this like slow trail of those kind of psychedelics and then ayahuasca became quite popular you started seeing it in major newspapers on people who had retreats in peru and the amazon and stuff like that so then i started doing more research on it and there were people who were telling me about dmt and they knew a guy and all of this and so i dabbled in it like i'd probably say like less than 10 times but i've had effects from nothing to nice fractals and then this time like two three weeks ago i got fucking fired out of a cannon like mm. i saw the other side of the coin it was fuck man like <laughs> it's not something that you should do lightly you know I, I have so much more respect for it now rather than it i, I totally get where alex gray and all of that lot get there get their get imagery their, from. Yeah, yeah yeah it's um so a friend of mine got it for me and um i was I've been building up my dosage over the times that I've been doing it. And then I was just, we had a nice meal with my friends, like a sending off meal. And then we went back to the shop and then I was just like, let's do some DMT. <laughs> and then I was working it out and I was just like, right, cool. So I did like a weed base. And, I, and then I, I've heard that with marijuana, it can like dampen the effect, but mm. I don't know. So I've, I've looked online about the weed sandwich. So you put a base of weed, DMT, then weed on top. But I didn't do the weed topper. So I just put the DMT on the top, blitzed it, and then held it for 10 seconds, then exhaled. And don't remember the exhale. And then all of a sudden, it was just like, you know, out of Star Wars when they hit the... Yeah, light speed. Yeah, yeah, and I was yeah. like, fuck. And then it was all these red and white, like, mandalas that were kind of, like, folding like this. And it was getting quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker. And then it just, like, popped. And then it was just black. And I was just like, whoa. And then there were all these kind of uh, shapes floating around that were, like, like fractals, I guess, you know, where they kind of like open up like that and they keep opening and then mm -hmm. they open up and that. Nah, and then it was all these kind of like crazy, crazy colors. And then stuff was like, go, it was moving really, really quickly, uh, like unfolding like this. And then it all slowed down. And then I was kind of, then they'd like, and then what I noticed when it was at the peak, like I couldn't tell the difference between my eyes being closed or open. I could feel my eyes opening and closing, you but still it was the this. same shit. Right, and I was right. just like, whoa. So I came back in the room. I felt amazing, like total euphoria. Did you, can I ask you a question? Did you feel like during that time when you were watching those fractals fold and continually unfold, did you feel any sense of information being transmitted? No. No, no. communications occurring? No. Nothing like that. Just it, more just watching very something visual. happen. Yeah. It, I felt like I was just like a, a floating spirit watching, watching. something okay. happen. Uh, the previous time to that, I had this f spinning head 
probably about four feet away from me that was just spinning around like this. And it was just, there was always a face here and on the side, very much like an Alex Gray yeah. painting. Yeah. And it had this colorful um, rainbow water fountain coming out of the head. And it was mm. just like this and it was just going everywhere and it was just spinning. And then I had this, so I had this sense of a, a large female figure behind me and she, she put her hand on my shoulder, mm. but I couldn't see her. I just, there was this real presence and it was just very warming, very kind of like, you're on the right track, Mike, like everything's okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then I came back into the room. Um, but um, after this time, a couple of weeks ago, I was, I was buzzing, I felt incredible, I was totally euphoric. And I was just like, I wanna go again. So I had like five, 10 minutes to kind of pull my shit together. My friend had a dose um, and then I had another dose and it wasn't as pleasant. It was really mm. introspective, really uh, what I was saying earlier, like an accountability mirror because I'd taken quite a lot of mushrooms with my girlfriend uh, over the Christmas period. So I was just finishing a microdose period and we, we were kind of celebrating like the last London Christmas. Mm. And I was just like, let's have a bang, you know? Mm. So I had a nice trip together, had a great time. She went to bed and I was still tripping and I was just drawing. And it, uh, again, it was this accountability mirror thing. And this second trip of DMT the other week, it kind of felt like it brought it all back up again. And it was kind of saying to me, you haven't addressed these problems. So I, in the back of my mind, like at the moment, I kind of had this thing of just, I really need to kind of work on this. I need to address being more empathetic, helping my friends kind of doing stuff um, unselfishly and you know i think like now that i'm living in new york it's kind of like well i kind of have to go out of my way and be more friendly and you know make new friends and stuff like that so yeah i'm looking forward to kind of changing that's you know, cool myself that's cool that's really cool yeah and you know the trips are fun to hear about the the visuals and the stories and i've been around this stuff so long i i love hearing the stories but really what i'm interested in is what 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 do you take away <laughs> you know what yeah. are you taking away from that that yeah. really then and that's i think that's something that should be highlighted to people that are listening is you took something away from that it, it's gonna it's gonna make you you're gonna be more empathetic that's on your mind that's something yeah. you have at least recognized oh i have it's a habit issue. of being not empathetic enough you know mm -hmm. i i did some um this is a few months ago but i it was alone in my backyard and I've done DMT maybe a dozen times. And I decided, and I had had a couple of whiskeys and I was feeling really froggy mm -hmm. and I was, and I had music playing loud and, and I, I don't know, it seemed like my attitude was cavalier and mm -hmm. just, and I've never had a very, I've only gotten a lot of love from Lucid Jennings. I get a lot of, you're okay. Nice. You know, um, that you're in a beautiful place. You, when you die, you come back to this place. Like these beautiful messages are very reassuring. And, and there's deeper levels to that. I've had some, some recommendations to look at things to improve, but I've never gotten slapped. Oh, right. And I've been in rooms with friends who've done DMT who come out and they're, they're okay, but they're like, dude, I got to go home and think about some shit. You can yeah. tell. Yeah. You can see it change shifts. Doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. I've yeah, never yeah, been yeah, slapped. Yeah. And so this night I decided to, to, to rip this. I actually have a vape pen a, a friend got for me and I, I've never done it that way. And I'm like, this little fucking thing can't, <laughs> you know, I've had the real shit. So yeah, I, I ripped this thing, like, I think three mat. Oh, bad. Just as hard as I could hit this thing. And then, you know, second one, things are getting weird. I get one more in and then, and basically my entire re reality, eyes open, turns to plastic. Me, oh, wow. I'm like a Ken doll. Everything has giant, the chairs, everything's smiling at me like Bugs Bunny. The trees are plastic. Whoa. The rocks are plastic. And at first I kind of giggle a little, but then I feel like it's been 10 minutes or so at this point. And now I'm, you know, I'm really not comfortable with the fact that my hands are, aren't flesh and blood. Yeah. They're made of rubber, yeah. you know, yeah, and yeah, now, yeah. and slowly a message starts coming through, which is, it's kind of saying to me, like, you need to be more grateful. You, oh, you've lost sight of gratitude. Like you sit in this backyard with flesh and blood running through your hands. 
with trees that are alive with the rain from the sky and the soil of the dirt. Nice. Look at their texture. Look at the wind that blows through them, the, 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 the bugs that crawl on them, the birds that land in them. This is as beautiful as it gets. So just to remind you how beautiful that is, we're going to turn it all to fucking plastic. <laughs> yeah. And we're not going to let it go away right away. And yeah, so, yeah. You, well, we need to be uncomfortable. Oh, I got yeah. too. I got uncomfortable. Yeah, I, ran, I ended up running in the house. Cause I didn't know what to do. Cause I'm like, this should have went away. And then I went in the house, fucking plastic. So I end up going upstairs, <laughs> waking my wife up. I'm like, if she rolls over and she's like <laughs> Play a bear. Barbie doll, <laughs> I, that's it. Cause I, then I started getting the idea that I blew a circuit. Dude. Yeah. I'm like, think, I blew oh, a fucking fuck, circuit. Too far. This is yeah. my new reality. I'm going to yeah, be in a fucking rubber yes. room somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm going to be telling people the whole world's plastic. And they're going to be like, yeah, this guy on. in this room, he <laughs> thinks everything's made of plastic, <laughs> Yeah, you know? Dude. And, uh, and she rolled over and, and it just stopped right there. She looked up at me. And of course, her look was like, the fuck, the fuck are you doing? <laughs> and I'm like, I kind of grabbed her arms and her face. And I was like, okay, okay. I'll tell you about it tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, man. But I mean, it was in there. So I guess you could call it a bad trip. But I tell you what, man, I have no desire to do it right now. I, that shook me up pretty good. Yeah. And I still look at my hands and trees and leaves and wind. And I there's a part of me, it's like, that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Reality yeah, yeah. is pretty fucking cool. It's crazy, isn't it? It's because it's funny. I was listening to some of these podcasts on my flight over here, and um, I, there was something that you said that I that that really like struck with me. You, you, I think you were talking to Jamie Thomas, and you were saying, you know, people are looking on their phones and not looking up at trees and being like, it's fucking incredible that there's trees and that you're alive. And when I had my freak out uh, last week after smoking, and I was just like. I really had to like pull myself back out of it. And I was just like, you know, it's incredible. One, that you're alive. Two, that you, you know, that you're doing this, you know, as much as it's nerve wracking and terrifying that you're going to a new country and starting again and the anxieties of have I got enough work to pay rent and shit like that. But, you know, the, the sheer fact that I have the ability to do that and I'm experiencing yes. it, you know, that, that in itself is, incredible like when you're ill you, you're like oh I can, i'm gonna be so grateful when i'm healthy yeah you know it's like that and you know I, people get so wrapped up in the small bullshit of life that is probably manifested by yourself and society that we live in etc but just the fundamentals of having air in your lungs and mm -hmm. communicating with people and you know just yeah i really ha have stripped it back and just being grateful yeah, you, know, the, you just, you just, yeah, that's exactly what the message I got. Yeah. And I know that I've read the books and I, I know that, you know, I, yeah. that's something I would say to someone if I was giving them In advice. Passing, yes, yeah. But I, agree. I realized after that trip, was I really, really fucking being it minute to minute, day by day? And the answer was up until that trip, no. Yeah. I was rushing to my car, bitching about traffic, trying to get somewhere and not, you know, just uh -huh. blowing right past my kids were playing or whatever beautiful thing that yeah. happened to be happening around me. Um, of course I didn't blow past all of it, but I definitely slowed that yeah. down and yeah. I'm taking that breath and being like, this is cool. And you're right. Just the fact we are like, we have the ability to do things that stress us out yeah. as a gift. Yeah, I agree. Um, that's it's really cool. And that's what I love about hallucinogenics. And it seems like in all of them, that lesson finds its way to you through all the different hallucinogenics. It's yeah. that message is weaved into mushrooms, LSD, DMT. Yeah. And I've had that message come to me through all of those various modalities. And, yeah. um, it's and a good one. It's a good yeah, one. Yeah. And how like revered they were by ancient cultures as well. And like that was another thing that kind of drew me into it. Cause I've like, you know, a lot of like Graham Hancock's work that I've, I've read a Graham. lot. Yeah. And like, I love all of that stuff. Like there's a part of me that just wants it all to be true. Like I'd love, well, it seems like it's on the way, like evidence that's coming through and like his program highlighted some crazy stuff that I was just like, why aren't people like excavating those caves and stuff like that? So I think when that time comes, I think there'll be this like new dawn of civilization if we don't blow, blow ourselves up before then. I tell you, man, I do wonder about what it would take because we do seem to be on a, a collision course with 
worse and worse things. If you know, just the fact we're still at war, we're still fighting over resources. We're st- you know, yeah. just, we're still not helping our our homeless population. I can go down the list of things at this point in our evolution of society. You would think we would be moving beyond some of this stuff mm-hmm. into another level of yeah. existence, and it doesn't seem like it's going that way. And I wonder what it would take. And the only two things I can come up with is a, a catastrophe of of, of global level, yep. or um, these medicine, plant medicines really entering our day-to-day cultures. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason the anthropologists will show you every single civilization they've ever studied had the use yeah. of hallucinogenics yeah. routinely used within it. Yeah. It's only recently, you know, really in uh, modern times when the Catholic Church and Christianity basically removed it. Yeah. Completely. And ever since we did that, look at the behavior of humans since we took yeah. Plant medicines away. Yeah, Empathy really has gone way down. Yeah. Cooperation has gone way down. Yeah. Uh, gratitude has gone way down. Yeah. And now let's magnify everything by throwing in technology, phones, and everyone's living through a fake universe that's being shown through. And maybe we should get into that because I know that yeah, was something definitely. we talked about earlier is, you know, like TikTok and, and, and social media in general. What do you, what's your take on that? I mean, I'll just say it before we, before you start. I mean, obviously it has its great benefits. I love opening up my phone and seeing the 50 best tattoos that were done yesterday. So I can yep. kind of vibe from that and grow myself. And you've seen tattooing expand rapid, rapidly. You've seen many industries expand rapidly because everyone's being able to leapfrog from what was done yesterday in their mm-hmm. field onward and upward and all that. So there's, you know, all, the benefits are there. Um, and also beautiful idea, ideas of love. I, I have, I watch uh, on my Instagram, Ram Dass is stationed. So every day I get a quote from Ram Dass. So nice. you could say the phone's evil, but I'm reading a quote from Ram Dass. That's not evil. That's yeah. fucking great for me. Boy, I guess it depends on what you're using it for. It's totally. kind of like a, a tool. Are you going to use the hammer to build a house or are you going to use the hammer to run around and break furniture? Exactly. So exactly. That's kind of my take on it. But I do feel like a lot of people are just breaking furniture with it. Very true. <laughs> I, I totally agree. You know, I think, I mean, as, as a, a person who grew up kind of with the beginnings of the internet um i remember my dad being very kind of he was just like we should get on the internet it's going to be crazy and like we had like a home pc and like it was just like whoa you can do all this crazy Mm -hmm. stuff on it um and i was you know we had msm messenger in my space when i was younger so these were like the real like the genesis of what we have today and you know i I made relationships on it. Like it was a uh, MSN Messenger, especially. I could speak to my friends after school, and we could just have little chats. And you could then you could have like group chats where it was like my friendship group from school, and we we're all on it at night, and we we're all just chatting. And you know, so I think like having grown up with it, um, I think it's um, as you said, it's a tool. And Instagram has a lot of failures, but arguably, like I'd probably say I wouldn't be where I am today without it. I think that it really enabled tattooers and photographers and artists to put your work out there for free mm-hmm. um, and to a worldwide audience. You know, mm-hmm. companies could see it, individuals can see it, you know, like some commercial work I've done has been because they've seen my stuff on Instagram. Mm-hmm. But equally, there's a bad side of it, you know, it affects your mental health. If you're like, why didn't this get enough likes? Even if you're stoked on the tattoo and then if it, it, it falls short on Instagram or mm-hmm. social media, you start questioning it why didn't they like it you know and then you start racking your brain instagram isn't what it used to be it's very different now and i think for small business owners i think it's a really difficult time because you have to be one you have to make your product so for us it's tattooing so you know you draw the tattoo and then you do the tattoo so you know that could be x amount of hours and then you've got to do You've got to film it. You've got to take good photos. You've got to do like, yeah. you know, with the iPad it's now. another job. It's a whole nother fucking job. And then you're, you're trying to uh, put as much time into the thing that is kind of like your bread and butter, which for me is tattooing. So, you know, I still want to give my most amount of time I can to that. But then, you know, if you do that, but then you don't make a good product to put on Instagram, What's the point of that? You know, unfortunately, in today's world, it's not like magazines anymore or like conventions aren't as important anymore because you can just 
you have Instagram, you have social media. Right. So I think it's a tough because now I, I'm I'm personally look once I get a bit more settled into New York, I'm gonna be looking into grabbing someone to do my social media. Mm. Um or getting someone to like I can give them the content and they can turn it into a nice reel. Into, so you can get back to being a craftsman. Yeah, because, you know, I'm not, I'm not, protect, uh, you know, I grew up with a lot of like the birth of technology that we have like kind of today in the modern social media world. But, you know, still, it's still something that I don't love. I love creating and drawing and making nice colorful pieces. Well, how do I, and you're right. I mean, and, and we, and here at Guru, that's one of the, the reasons I've made the shop kind of larger is because I saw the need for that for the artists. It's like, okay, there's a new job showing up. Yeah. None of us really want to be doing it. So yeah. if I can get this place big enough and kind of have people helping with all that stuff, it, that, that helps. And yeah. having someone else do it helps a lot. Um, and I do have a social media manager here that helps oh, me with a lot. I nice. do, yeah. But I mean, the guys still do their own thing and then they pass it to her and then she cleans it up and make it. And then I have videographers that come around it. So we, yeah, you know, we're build, I'm trying to build a, a machine where we could take that off the artist's plate more and more and more yeah, so they can brilliant. get back to what they do. But you know, that, so that's true. But what, let me ask you this. What do you do? Like how, like how does social media grab you and how do you, do you have rules around it? Like, okay, this much online, put your phone down. Does it, or do you just kind of. Uh, no, I probably should because I noticed this Monday, uh, you know, when you get the weekly screen reports on your phone, mm -hmm. man, mine was up 111%. But, you know, I had a lot of shit to do in New York, like going through like real estate and fucking all that right, shit. Right, right. So I was on it more and I was checking my emails more and, you know, sorting out bank accounts and stuff. So, but yeah, I think it is important, especially if you have an addictive personality or anything like that, you know, you should put a time limit on it. But I know people who put time limits on it and then just scrap that anyway. Mm -hmm. they, they, they had that blocker on it and then they're like, oh, scrap it. Right. And they just scroll through anyway. So... But I, I'm quite disciplined with it, whereas I'll, I'll try not to look at my phone for an hour when I wake up and I'll get up and I'll stretch and stuff like that. And I'll kind of just get outside, try and get some natural light in my face. Just try and pull my shit together before I'm instantly laying in bed, just going. Before that, they yeah, enter your life. Yeah, I, it's really important. And um, I think it's a bit different for younger people now and their social groups and stuff like that. Um, but as a 36 year old, like for me, I don't think I would have social media if it wasn't for the work side of it personally. Yeah, me too. I wouldn't um, even have it. Yeah. It's, or I might have a personal page. It just shows my kids and stuff. So my, you know, friends, yeah, so kids, family and family, family can see, and they can check in and stuff. Yeah, I agree. But yeah, I have no limits on it. I just, I, I try and like post regularly because it seems like so much is, now is algorithm based rather than just a, you know. I, whatever the other one is where it's just dunk 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 so i try and post regularly but then you know stuff gets in the way you know yeah. and try and just to spend time and like an hour a day trying to make good content to put out there i'm not excited to do that yeah not at all so I, it's begrudging to do it and like my girlfriend will tell you like i sit there and i'm like i've got to make a reel and i'm sitting there i'm swearing at my phone like oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it's bullshit you know um, so yeah, and then trying to match it with some music and then, you know, I remember when YouTube came on the scene and everyone was saying, oh, people's attention spans are going to fall off a cliff. Cause now like, it's not an hour TV show. It's like 10 minutes, but now you have TikTok, which is 15 seconds or 10 yeah. seconds. So now YouTube looks like the long format, you know, <laughs> which is crazy, which is bananas. So, uh, I think it's. Uh, I do worry about people's attention spans and how, you know, Instagram isn't real life or social media. It's not real life. It is literally a highlight reel of all the best bits. Like mm -hmm. when I was in New York last week, I was making sure that I was kind of like on Instagram a lot. So I was doing a lot of stories of just like cool shit. Mm -hmm. And all my friends were just like, oh, you're having a great time settling in. But uh, it wasn't like that I'd given myself an ulcer from the stress. And like I was running around with thousands of or dollars. Or I just smoke a blunt and I'm having a yeah, panic having attack. A I'm peeking out somewhere near <laughs> Domino Park, like wigging out. And like, you know, of course, of course I'm not going to put that on Instagram so yeah. although if you did it might have been funny I, I honestly <laughs> I'm starting to think that too lately I'm like 
Maybe just I start putting the up real some world. Of, yeah, man. Just the, what's going on today, buddy? Yeah, what's the real? Because I was, I was toying with the idea of just being like having a thing of just being right a Londoner in New York mm -hmm. and just do a thing every week on thing that I find bizarre, the struggles, the pros, the ups, the downs. Yeah, yeah, maybe just do a reel of that just to kind of like grab people's attention on my page a little bit more. But I've done a few posts for this show that. I was weird. Like I was on TikTok. I think most of our TikToks get between 8,000 views to maybe 20,000 views for the show. Nice. And that's pretty average. And then I, I, I had one where, you know, I just, I, I was so full of gratitude after the launch day and all these people wrote me and told me, um, how much they love the show and all this support came through. And I was on the verge of tears in my eyes. And I just said nice. to the camera, that one, 500,000 views. Nice. I mean, look at the difference there, you know, yeah. and, and I guess my, I guess what I took away from that is I think, yeah, that's, I think a lot of people are, are a little bit sick of the um, highlight reel. Yeah. Maybe have it a bit more personal and authentic. the real you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Be authentic. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. But you're right. I mean, what is this going to do? I mean, I'm 51 years old. I'm not too worried about it. I don't have a natural tendency to open up my phone and live on it because I just didn't grow up with it. It's just, yeah. in fact, I kind of have an aversion towards my phone. If I'm on there, I look at it like I look at any other thing I do, I have to do email. I have to do my social media. I have to draw a piece. I have to have a manager meeting. Like I just segment it. It's a job. It's yeah. a job. Yeah. And I, when I'm on my phone, I'm working. Yeah. Um, but I'm also didn't grow up. I don't have that natural tendency. I think because of my age, I look at my kids, you know, 17, one of them and 12. And I, yeah, I'm like, and they're friends and just tick tock, tick tock, flick, 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 flick. Really? And I worry about that. I worry about their, their creative minds. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I spent so many hours using my imagination. Yeah. Because TV yeah, sucked. Too. There was like six channels and there was usually nothing on unless it was Saturday morning and you got to watch cartoons, cartoons. on Saturday morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, the rest of the week, I was just bored. Yeah. So I would go out and pick up a grasshopper and tie a thread to its foot and yeah. let it fly around and then... Maybe yeah, I would totally. pull its wings off and, and you know, look at, look at corn. Be outside. Just, yeah. <laughs> so imagination, it was being used. And I, I do worry about that. But however, at the same time, I don't want to be the old guy trying to say that we're fucked because this could be human consciousness merging with technology yeah. in, in 200 years. We'll look back and be like, that was just this necessary, awkward step the towards step. what we've become. So I, I don't want to give it good or bad. All I can say is it's, it's really odd. And I think, there is going to be some damage caused by it, but it could be the um, second coming, you know? Yeah, yeah, I agree. I'd like to talk a little bit about AI as well, because mm. that shit is blowing I'm glad you mind. brought it up, because it's usually me that always brings it yeah, up. Yeah, it's... Um I really think we're very much on this verge of some sort of cyborg human thing happening. I mean, like, you know, Elon said it well when, like, if you know, if you don't have your phone, you know, it's you, you are basically a cyborg already. You just it's just not connected into you you mm. know so i really think we're on the cusp of that and you know ai i started messing around with ai in july last year a friend of mine showed it to me actually up in portland um and i was just like oh shit <laughs> <laughs> and then i started i just seeing it develop and i i've been using mid journey by um that's the one yeah dude that shit's not i'm about ready to get on i've been on it yet i had a friend oh, tell me dude because you gotta go to the website and you gotta do something then you get the app so you just disc is through discord okay um, it's through discord. I'll, I'll, we, we, I'll show you it afterwards um i'll show you some of the stuff i've created but man it's it's wild it's really insane and now i've been learning about how to prompt properly and like going like i went down a rabbit hole have you week. tried entering you know how you you feed it data basically uh -huh. have you tried feeding it your work only and see what it does with you um no i haven't yet because that would be interesting yeah because uh, you can you can type in like uh you know lady head in the style of picasso and it'll come up right or, or you can do like Whatever you fucking want, you know. You can can you in, feed? Are you writing in keywords to Mid Journey, or are you giving it photographs? Like, actual, so you can do both. Okay, but both. Um, it depends what I want to do because, like, some, like, if I find like some really good reference, say on Pinterest, sometimes I'll take that and I'll chuck it into Mid Journey, and I'll be like, do that in the style of Franz Mark, or in the style of Picasso, or Magritte, or mm. something like that, and I'll just see what comes out. And like, I'm not gonna lie, that it's like. 
sifting through shit, you know. Life not every, sucks. Yeah, not everything's a home run, you know. There's definitely a lot of shit to go through. So, But every now and then you hit this dope thing, you're like, fuck. And then, like, what I like about it is, like, I'm not going to take that and then tattoo that image. I'm going to take that and then use that as reference. And then what I like about that is that, that no one's using that reference. Because, mm. like, you know, sometimes you can see, especially you know, as creatives, like this, especially in the tattoo world, you can see reference that people have used yeah. and you're like, I know that. Yep. So this cancels that. It brings it's, in something novel. Yeah, totally new, never been seen before and probably won't ever be created again because you can, uh, through mid journey, you get four options that come out and then you can just refresh that and another four will come out mm -hmm. and then you can pick each one to make variations on number one, two, three or four. But you're aggregating Further yeah, down yeah, you get you, you kind of like fine tuning it right, to getting right. it to where you want. A friend of mine told me just be as descriptive, use use as many adjectives as you want or or, or or as you can. But then I started looking on like kind of like Reddit groups and stuff like that. There was a, a guy who put up really like selfishly put up a whole um, prompt thing of you know how to get like uh, cinematic lighting or how to get certain perspectives and how if you want to make something abstract you write a chaos and then a number mm. between zero and a hundred mm. so if you want it really abstract you write chaos 100 or if you want it pretty chill chaos 30 mm. so there's all these like secret little prompts that you can kind of put in to kind of get where you want to get to so Interesting. yeah it's fascinating and just seeing where it's jumped literally from july last year is insane where it'll be in another year yeah it's gonna be mind-blowing and now chat gbt4 just came out so i'm gonna mm. be fucking around on that and like the twitter space is really good for seeing all that ai stuff come out as well i saw there was a guy who directed a whole movie so he wrote the script on chat gpt he ran the images through mid journey and then he ran like all the editing and film for another film ai and he put it on twitter and then he Jesus. broke down in the feed exactly what he did. And I was just like, fuck. And it looked uh -huh. sick. It looked, I was just like, that looks really cool. Yeah, you know, it looked like a really nice, like kind of not quite anime, but kind of like 3D right. sort of stuff. And I was Oof. just like, this is insane. And like, obviously the, it, it's, there are reasons to be scared, you know? And, uh, you know, I know uh, concept artists and stuff like that right. who, who have been posting on Instagram, like no AI and stuff like mm. this. And, you know, we've chat like briefly on Instagram about like, you know, another change that's happening where unfortunately I think people will be losing their jobs. Unfortunately, I think. We're not stopping it. <laughs> no, dude, that, that, this, that is out no of the box. AI, no AI, no AI. I mean, I, I, yeah. And I, I understand you're scared, you know, like there's a guy who I follow who's like one of the lead concept artists for Disney. He does a load of stuff for the Avengers um, and he's freaking out about it. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I heard you say about um, the people you tattoo that guy from Adobe, who's yeah, I have a client. He's uh, he's the lead creative director for Adobe. Yeah, has been for like twenty years. And so he, you know, beneath him are a bunch of graphic designers, digital designers. Yeah. and he said that in his group, there, yeah, it's a major. They're freaking out. They're freaking out. Yeah, I bet. And there's, you know, I mean, I think it's quite easy for me to kind of be like this because there's no had to be quite jovial about it because there's no um you know there's no ai tattoo machine at the moment yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah we do have that one thing going for us that there is a we still need to do practical it. needles to skin yeah. part of our job but what makes a great tattooer nowadays is the uniqueness and the uh and the um the beautifulness of their art which used to be also a part of our job like mm -hmm. i had to be able to draw a snake cooler than the next guy yeah but and but now if people are using ai that's been removed now a guy can through ai get a badass looking snake that's as yeah. cool as something i could come up maybe even cooler so then it you know the idea being that we get to a place where the tattooer is just more of a technician yeah and of course there's still a lot to that part of it like some yeah, yeah, yeah. you know learning to be a good technician as a tattooer is it's uh, but Very but still you've the, the idea would be you've removed half of what makes a successful tattooer unique very true if this was to continue the way it goes potentially yeah i don't know i, I i've had this conversation with Crail simpkins and i had it with uh, dave koenig and and, and uh, another artist i had i don't think of it right now 
oh, me and uh, uh, Marcus Lenhard talked mm-hmm. about it. And we all end up right here where we're just what like, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> there's yeah. no like solution or we just, we're just, just acknowledging. Just have to watch it. Just, just have see, to watch it. See but, I, but I'm not, I'm not anti. I mean, I like your idea of like using it to create novelty and then taking that novelty into your work and then run your filter through it. Right. And yeah, then, I think that's, and then, then that's kind of going towards what you said earlier, which is this idea of us becoming cyborgs, right? In yeah. that way, you're half human, half machine. Your, yep. your artistic output is half human, half machine. Yeah. Even the creative aspect. I mean, the iPad, people go, well, that's the iPad. No, the iPad was just a tool. You still had to draw. Yeah. Yeah. Might, it gets, it's a piece of paper. I mean, it just it's, happens yeah. to be digital. This is actually coming into the creative process. Yeah. That's I the agree. part that the human did uniquely. Only the human could do that. Cows don't do it. Trees don't seem yep. to do it. Yep. You know, we create, we come up with novel ideas. We build airplanes and we make paintings and we make art and music and, and, and now like there's that. a machine yeah, there's, that's there's, doing yeah. it yeah and we're and i guarantee it all artists all musicians not all but all, there's gonna be artists musicians every creative out there a majority a, a portion of those creatives are going to be fusing and using and definitely and using it so absolutely and i think i think it's also important important to kind of like have a creative doing the input so it's not like the AI is doing it on its own yet. Mm-hmm. So it's still, I still think, you know, having, you know, my creativity put into AI rather than an accountant using it, I right. think will, will the quality of the stuff that comes out will be different mm-hmm. because, you know, the stuff that I have in my head that I'm trying to put through AI is no different than the idea that I want to kind of put through my hand to draw. Mm-hmm. So. I like the idea of that I can run both side by side and like the thing with AI at the moment is that it's not fine tuned enough. I find like what I can sh- put my idea going through my hand to get stuff out is very direct. It goes straight through it. Whereas I kind of have to find, I have to fuck around and I kind of have to keep refreshing. I have to keep fine tuning it and getting it there. Whereas sketches, sketching is very direct. Well, that's cool. I'm glad to see you're playing around with it. I'm not going to be the guy who's like, oh, you, you're messing with AI. You're not a fucking tattooer. <laughs> you're not a tattooer anymore. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it is what it is. Stuff's yeah. coming, time, things change, times change. I think it's kind of exciting that we um that we're even playing around with stuff like that and we'll yeah. see we're entering like a, it's almost like i feel like i'm living in a sci-fi movie yeah i agree yeah. like i love sci-fi and i love that whole world and i remember when i started like pushing my my ta- my style of tattooing around the british like uh convention circuit like i'd have my flash laid out on the table like i said earlier i remember seeing these old guys walk up to me at the liverpool tattoo convention and they were like talking to themselves old biker guys like big fucking long beards and they were like that's not tattooing I was standing there and I was just like, well, I'm tattooing at a tattoo convention, so it is. And mm. like we had this kind of conversation. I could see them getting pissed. And I was just like, are you pissed because you are you tattooers and you're not tattooing here? Like, yeah. so, you know, that kind of made me realize that I was kind of doing the right thing. That I, I like disruption. I like change. Right. I think it's important. If what you're doing is pissing off the old yeah, guard. You're on the right route. You're on you're the, on the right, right route. route. Yeah. I do. I like the disruptive portion of it too. The yeah. anarchy kind of vibe. It yeah, has. me too. So it's it's cool. I didn't realize your before we started this today your thing with mushrooms and how they've helped you mm. in a medicinal type of a way. And I threw out a couple ideas. One of them was mushrooms. So you're, you're gonna, I think you're tattooing mushrooms. Oh, I am indeed, man. This yeah, is appropriate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I agree. I, I that makes it even more special because of our conversation today. And you're gonna be the guy to. I don't have any mushrooms tattooed on me. I've always wanted to have some because I've done a lot of them. They've helped me. I microdose, and I just think you know we always want to get little symbols and on a, on a towel talesmans on us that remind us of our lives and what's important to us yeah, so amazing. to have a guy who truly believes in it and loves it yeah, and has sick. had positive experiences from it doing it is dope amazing yeah stoked man all right well stoked. then um why don't we i have to take a i have to take a bad pee break Me so too, this, man. Is a, this is a good time to <laughs> cut a fix segue dude. thank you for paying, uh tuning in we're gonna go over to the other side you're gonna rip some mushrooms and then we'll be back to talk about it tight cheers brother Fuck Boom. yeah man
me and Mike like mushrooms. It, if I'm gonna have someone tattoo some mushrooms on my leg, I want it to be a true believer. <laughs> Hallelujah, my friend. <laughs> Let's go to the promised land. Are we about halfway in now? Yeah, man. Yeah, maybe a little bit further, actually. Yeah, two thirds, I'd say. How you feeling, Aaron? <laughs> I feel like I'm on mushrooms. <laughs> oh, yeah, we should have done mushrooms. Well, I'll get a little smart out here to tie about that. Just enough to, just enough to make the tattoo a little good. I was thinking about that, that you could have. Um, I'm Welcome back. All right, everybody. I don't know how much of that you got to see, but that's my new Achilles tendon. Huh? Look at them mushrooms. Making me want to eat some mushrooms. <laughs> the texture, dude, that piece is killer. Thanks, man. That's you a real honor, man. fucking killed it. Cheers to you, man, my friend. Salut, dude. Cheers. Much appreciated. Mm. A real pleasure. Thank you. Um... So we're wrapping things up, but I do want to, you know, maybe hear a little more about when we were tattooing, you were talking about a book thing you might be working on and some other stuff. So what, what are you doing? What's what's in the, I mean, you just got to New York. Obviously, you got to settle in. You got to start yep. tattooing. We all know you're going to be doing that. We're going to tell people where to find you. But are other projects, other dreams, other goals? Yeah. So before I came out to New York, I've been working on um, like a color theory book um, because I think at, personally at the moment when I started tattooing, finding color theory specific for tattooers was thin on the ground. I couldn't mm. find anything. So over the years, that has definitely gotten better. And when I started really developing my color and understanding color theory a lot more, like obviously a lot of it is painter based or graphics based or uh, computer generated stuff. So I was like, there must be a way. So over like the last 10 years, I've kind of accumulated this knowledge and now I'm funneling it into a book. You are, all yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When, it's, when it's, uh, any expectations uh, so at the moment it got put on hold for when i was uh traveling and stuff because i wanted to kind of get it done and finished before i moved but like time scales um, kind of went out the window a little so that's on hold for the moment and when i get settled i'm going to kind of pick that up again and hopefully by the end of the year that should be Available. This year, so, yeah. Fingers crossed if everything goes swimmingly. Well, definitely hit me up. I'd be, I'd love to. Yeah, dude, I'd love to send it over to you like a draft, and uh, if you could give me some feedback. And... Well, that too, but I meant more just to tell the world about it. Oh you know? fuck yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Gotta like, get yeah, it out there. I really want to. Um, once it started like going through proofing and stuff like that, and that on their end they're going to send me some stuff that I can kind of get going on social media. And another thing you had mentioned while we were tattooing is you're excited to start some. Uh, some larger. I mean, your pe your work has been um, relatively piece based. You know, not yes. necessarily small. I mean, there's some football size pieces. It's but it's a lot of that. But yeah. you're settling into New York, and you were mentioning, hey man, I'm thinking I'm gonna start kicking off some some body sized work. Yeah, I really do. And like, um, you know, watching your work over the years, and been a big fan of your stuff, and just seeing, you like transferring something that because i was traveling so much i was doing one shotters so if i can somehow transform that into large scale body work mm -hmm. um that is the goal and i'm really hoping in new york i can kind of because i'm working with like rg and kiku and people like that that have those body suits behind them and that experience so i'm hoping being around that on the daily can kind of it's gonna rub off yeah even if it is like kind of not necessarily what i do i as far as I'm concerned, there is like fundamentals that are applicable. So if I can just transform that, put some time into developing it into my work and 
I look forward to that. Dude. Yeah, I no. love your work. You know that. But yeah, I would love to see your work on a like on a large I would, scale. I would love to see a body, like a full Fucking body. body suit. Be so like, I mean, a whole body Mike Boyd. Yeah, it'd be wild as fuck. Man. It would be wild as fuck. <laughs> yeah, I'm dude. I'm gonna put that out in the universe, dude. Yeah. That's got to happen. Yeah, man. Somebody out there. Yeah, hit me up, man. Hit him up. Let's go. Let's <laughs> fucking go, man. And you know, I, I mentioned we're doing a bodysuit art show this year at Guru yep. uh, Commitment Three in November. I invited you. You're man, coming. Stokes, so this dude. lines up with all this new adventures yeah, you want to be a yeah, part man. of. I think change is good, and you know, if I could finally get to a bodysuit artist level, you're already there. The, you just need a person. To it let just needs you. to. I need to do it. I need to kind of you get the ball rolling. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. just need the the the, the client. That, that's the toughest part. For yeah, me, finding at least. that unicorn, man. You know, they're unicorns. I mean, I mean, a lot of people think they want to, to do it, and yes. then they get through maybe the back portion, and they have their legs to go, and they're like, "Holy shit, mm -hmm. I, I need it." They'll tell you they need a break, and you never see them again. They're just running for the hills. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or they lose their job, or you know, something anything happens, can happen. Right. You know, so they get married, have a couple of kids, and yeah, you know, priorities the body's change out the window. Yeah, yeah. but. You'll find them. They'll come. And I, I'm excited to see you do that, man. I think a piece by you, a body size piece by you would be something the world has never seen. It'd be unique. Yeah. And then it'd be a statement. So. Yeah, I agree. I agree, man. Well, um, where, now that you've moved and all this, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me in Good Luck in Greenpoint uh in brooklyn um i'm gonna be a resident there four days a week that's right. gonna be my new home and um, name the guys you're working with there again so we've got hembo my good buddy he's the one who has amazing with work by the yeah, way thank you man and you've got kiku you've got rg you've got lango you've got justin weatherholt wait a minute lango Lango from San Francisco? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He does. Oh, he's out there now. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know Lango. Yeah, he used yeah, to yeah. work right in PB next door to me. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Tight. He's uh, he's from South America. Where's he from? God damn it. He's Brazilian. Brazilian. Yeah, he's yeah, a Brazilian. Yeah. yeah. Sick. What's up, Lango? Tight. Nice. Uh, we've got <laughs> Ruby May. Uh, Ruby May, she's another English tattooer, which is amazing. So cool. it's nice to kind of have like three English people in the shop. We've got Simone. He does fucking dope shit as well. Uh, Katie Vaughn, who does incredible shit nice, as well, man. Them. It's a real heavy hitter That's shop. That's a big you know? shop, yeah. big name so, shop. You know, I've got to cut my teeth again there and kind of pull my weight. So oh. looking forward to it, man. We're lucky to have you, my friend. Yeah, dude, We're lucky to have you. Man. Well, there you have it, everybody. Mike Boyd, check him out. You know where to find him. We'll have all the links at the end of the show. Um, and I have a feeling we'll, you'll be back here soon enough. Dude, man, everyone's so lovely here, man. You're always so welcoming. So I love saying you. You know, New York can get cold, my friend. Yeah, dude. You know, those Januaries and Februaries, man, I'm not looking Come forward on, to that. Visit, visit me. Visit me. <laughs> One last toast. Man, thank you to so you. much, man. To you for being, let me say it this way for being a guy that's followed his heart intuitively in the in the tattoo industry which i think is a rarity a lot of us just fall a lot of it's easy to fall into what do tattooers do and then fall <laughs> and you just broke the mold and went man. your own direction i have a lot of respect for that so, thank you man much you. appreciated man all right my friend mm. so there you have it everybody check him out thank you for tuning into the show i'm on youtube i'm on spotify i'm on apple music like, comment, share, all that stuff. I get a ton of great comments lately. Keep them coming. Let me know what you like, what you may not like, and uh, keep watching the show. Thanks for tuning in.